Thank you. <clears throat> this talk will unfold in three parts. And in the middle, there's an exercise where you get to participate in some table talk. Part one, survival. I met John Lyman in a parking lot after an Apple meeting. The meeting was full of growers and scientists who were promoting ecological farming. Lyman Orchards is best known for apples, but on this day he came up to me and said, let's talk peaches. You guys carry peaches? People love New England peaches. He also was looking for someone who could take over marketing his wholesale apple program. I was in need of growers that I could trust who could train me in the produce business. John was right about those peaches. People loved them. He made 3,000 cases available to us. We marketed his as tree ripe because those last couple days on the tree make a difference that you can taste. We put them on the supermarket shelf next to the California ones, but they looked different. Lyman peaches had peach fuzz on them and no PLU stickers. They were that farm stand peach in a supermarket setting. In the lifetime of Red Tomato, John Lyman's leadership really stands out. He's helped build our organization 100 ways over 20 years. But it was years before I realized how different he and I were politically and personally. But we had one pragmatic common purpose, which was the survival of farms in our region, the survival of his farm. And that cemented our relationship. This is the story of my friendship and business partnership with John Lyman and what it taught me about collaboration. It's also about the quest for that ultimate summer peach that we all start dreaming about pretty soon. When I met John Lyman in the late 90s, I was transitioning from equal exchange to red tomato. I had been fighting for three things my whole career, fair trade, organic, and great flavor. Equal Exchange, a fair trade co-op that I co-founded in 1986, had introduced the US audience to what was then a new idea. Fair trade with the very farmer who grew those beans you're about to buy. Now, I was trying to do the same thing with fruits and vegetables. As for organic, I was hardcore. At Cornell Ag School in the 1970s, I was that person seated in the middle of the classroom whose hand kept going up. When the subject was agronomy or pest management, I was always saying, uh, excuse me, uh, can we talk about organic farming? While working as a natural food buyer in the food co-op movement several years later, I discovered and wrote an expose of organic sunflower seed fraud that was being made by a commodity company in North Dakota, a national health magazine published the article, and afterwards the company confessed. At Red Tomato, produce had to be fresher and taste better. We put the farm's name right up there on the shelf next to the product. This differentiated our products from commodities. So a New England peach was somewhat differentiated. A tree-ripe New England peach, more differentiated. A tree-ripe peach grown by Lyman, Lyman Orchards ecologically, was still even more differentiated. We sold also Lyman's apples, and so began my career and training as an apple buyer. I toured apple farms all the time. I learned how to prune apple trees. I sat through winter meetings with scientists who were geeking out on the latest science on pest management. And I did that with John Lyman. 20 years later, Lyman and I are still attending the same meetings. We did just one month ago. He became the first farmer rep on the Red Tomato Board of Directors. He served nine years. And then, a couple years ago, he came back for one more term. He's invested endless time in our organization. And I've developed endless respect for John Lyman. He's a strategic thinker. And he's one of the most open-minded people that I know. Well, that's 
why I was caught off guard in the middle of this radio interview. So there we are, fielding questions from the interviewer, the normal ones. Tell me about Red Tomato. Tell me about demand for locally grown produce, blah, 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 blah. And then he turns to me and asks about climate change. So I said, well, actually, lately, a bunch of our orchards have been hurt by hail. What was once a once in a decade event seems to be happening now every couple of years. And then the interviewer turns to John, and John pauses and says, uh, actually, I'm not really convinced by the climate change science. And he says that he has ancestral voices in his ear generations back. He's been hearing about weather patterns and weather changes that go back hundreds of years. Sometimes those changes lasted for years. He also said that he's not convinced that humans are really the cause of climate change. Oh my. <laughs> then last summer, I'm driving to Lyman Orchards for a peach meeting with all of our peach growers that he was hosting, and we decided to have lunch afterwards. So, as we often do, as friends tend to do, we started our, our lunch just talking about personal stuff. So I shared a story about my mother-in-law, who had been visiting recently, and with her, she brought this video about the magnificence of bird biology. And we tried to ignore her. Um, but by the third or fourth mention, we said, okay, let's watch it. And, uh, and it was really beautiful. It was kind of National Geographic style. It wasn't National Geographic, and I'm watching this. And then halfway through the video, I'm realizing, huh, how come I don't notice any of the institutions where these ornithologists work? And the thing goes on. And then about eight minutes from the end, the narrator turns on evolution and introduces intelligent design as the explanation for bird magnificence. So I'm telling John all of this, and I look up, and there's this curious look on his face. And I said, John, what's up? And he says, well, um, actually, I believe in what's called young earth creation science. And he tells me that his view of the creation story is that the earth is about six or 7,000 years old. And he believes in the literal story that God created all life on earth in six days. Okay. How do I digest this? This is the person that I've sat through so many scientific meetings about agricultural science. Creation science is considered a pseudoscience by the professors who taught me in biology. How c and, and now I'm getting it. This is why I didn't recognize the institutional names. They were all religious institutions. One day, just for fun, John and I decided to compare our presidential voting records. <laughs> we, <laughs> we, went, we went back to the 70s when we're about the same age. We had not once voted for the same person. We were indeed that iconic blue and red divide that the historian Victor Davis Hanson wrote about in the National Review. The two Americas watch different news, they read different books, they listen to different music, and they watch different television shows. Red America and Blue America are spiraling into divisions that resemble the Civil War. Actually, John and I liked the same music when we were growing up. We listened to Chicago and The Doors. We've passed books back and forth. It's a way that we explore our differences such as his passion for Ronald Reagan. I definitely needed help with that one. <laughs> so you're beginning to get the picture. This isn't the story of political differences that explode. This isn't the story of two people, one of whom miraculously changes the other one around to see the light. This is the story of two, two people who are working closely together for a common purpose who discover more and more differences, but just keep on plodding forward. The fact of our differences actually wasn't that important. Because by the time I figured them out, I knew this person. I trusted him. I knew his story. At Red Tomato, 
We tell the farmer's stories whenever we can. There was John Lyman, standing on the shoulders of seven generations of farmers that preceded him. The first generation, another John and his wife, Hope Lyman, bought the farm in 1741, 277 years ago. Two of their nine children fought in the Revolutionary War. The second generation, a David Lyman, saw textile mills beginning to emerge in the New England landscape. So he gambled the farm, imported merino sheep, and, uh, and won that bet. Textiles became New England's leading industry. Um, two generations further, fourth generation, David Lyman II made his money and gamble off the farm on what became one of the first washing machines. It's a, it's a family of entrepreneurs. By the turn of the 20th century, Lyman Orchards had 500 acres of peaches, peaches on it. There was access to rail lines that took their fresh peaches all over New England until 1917. In that year, the temperatures dropped below zero and stayed there for four weeks. The ground froze to four feet deep, and every peach in New England, every peach tree was destroyed. It was that moment that turned Lyman Orchards and all kinds of farmers in New England toward apples, and that was really the explosion of the apple industry. So whereas John Lyman is 12th generation in the United States, in my, in my family, my two daughters are the first born generation in this country on my side. My immigrant story is also my parents' Holocaust survival story. My maternal grandparents fled from Germany to Holland in the early 30s. They wanted to come to the United States. My grandfather came here exploring business possibilities. But he got advice that he couldn't travel anymore, so he sent a wire back to my grandmother, still in Holland, and it said, I can't travel. Sell the house, sell the business, pack up the, the furniture and the kids, and get on a boat to New York City. The problem was there was no German quota left to come to the United States. But my grandmother had been born in Strasbourg, which was French at the time of her birth. And so she came with a container full of wine, which was their business, and the kids on the last boat out of Rotterdam as a family of French Jews. My father, Yecheskel Rosine, wasn't quite so lucky. He was the youngest of nine living in Czerstochowa in South Poland. At the start of World War II, Poland was the center of, of Jewry in Europe. There were 3.4 million Jews in Poland. By the end of the war, only 100,000, and most did not survive. He was in the Polish resistance with his cousin Avi. One night, Avi was captured by the Nazis planting a bomb on a railway line. He was shot on the spot. My father was a wanted man, so he took off and fled, and was eventually, in 1944, captured and sent to Auschwitz. He stayed there for a while and then was transferred to Dachau, where he survived till the end of the war. My father emigrated to Palestine, soon to become Israel, and he became an accountant. In 53, he met my mother, Edith Weiss, who was then visiting from the United States. They married in 55 and planned to live in Israel. Six months after I was born, my father died of a heart attack at age 39. I didn't really know him. Except I had always heard he had a charisma, a talent with people, a great sense of humor. The kind of moral strength that it takes to survive under Holocaust conditions actually shows up in the John Lyman history as well. Third generation William Lyman is known for his moral courage, not for any business or entrepreneurial savvy. He took great risk in a very racist state of Connecticut at the time when he refused to support the Fugitive Slave Act, which required that people provided aid to bounty hunters who were searching for runaway slaves. William Lyman uh, wrote in an editorial in the Middletown Press, good citizens 
cannot be slave catchers any more than light can be darkness. Today, Lyman Orchards is honored on Connecticut's on the State Freedom Trail. My father was liberated from Dachau almost exactly 100 years after that editorial was published. No, I never really knew him, but he's frequently in my mind. Sometimes I use his memory to kind of get me through some pretty overwhelming situations. I concoct this voice in my head and it says, your father survived Auschwitz. You can figure this out. The constant pressure we feel at Red Tomato to pay our farmers a decent price in a marketplace like this one, that actually often feels overwhelming. This market is flooded by commodity peaches and apples. That meeting where I first met John Lyman, that was a room full of apple growers and scientists who were promoting integrated pest management, or IPM for short. IPM's a way to manage pest problems through the mastery of orchard ecology. They bring in parasitic wasps, lacewings, ladybugs to control woolly apple aphid. They bring good mites in to feed on the bad mites. There's a biological tool called mating disruption, which controls moths. They protect bees with a pollinator protection plan. So these growers are using biological tools all they can, and then chemical tools as a last resort. In the state of Washington today, you may know this, that virtually all the organic apples grown and sold in the US are coming from Washington. In the eastern United States, it's extremely difficult to raise organic apples at a commercial volume because of the pest pressure, the humidity, and all the rain we get right there. We were developing a certification program which became Red Tomatoes Eco Apple and Eco Peach program. During my years at Red Tomato, I've broadened my definition of what sustainable farming is. We work with certified organic growers who practice IPM. We work with a lot of IPM growers who borrow from the organic toolbox. None of these are conventional growers in my mind. A conventional farm follows a calendar of preset recommendations for pesticide use, fertilizer application, which they get from a chemical company or from a, a university website. In the 30 years since Equal Exchange was started, organic labeling has gone from being an honor code to a private certification to the law. When I first learned about organic, it was all about soil health. When it became the federal law, a list of ingredients actually took precedence. Synthetics were no longer allowed, only pesticides that were made and derived from naturally occurring substances. As this story got told to the American public, increasingly it became the voice of business, people who were trying to sell organic at a very large scale. And as the narrative took hold, it got simpler, it became simplistic, and it became harder for me and harder for us to tell John Lyman's story in the marketplace. Consumers would come up to us and say, so is it organic? And I had 10 seconds to answer. But the best I could do took two minutes, and it wasn't simple. Sometimes people would look at me like I was some kind of a traitor. It just seems crazy to me that something as innovative and positive as IPM would be so hard to fit into the sustainable farming story. I haven't found a way to explain it yet. But when I was eight years old, my mother's close friend, also her mentor and boss, Jeannie Ginsburg, taught me how to make rhymes. This powerful woman, who stands four feet 10 inches, towered over a thousand three and four year olds that she taught over 50 years in a cooperative nursery school that she founded. Lately, my inspiration in rhyming comes from the musical Hamilton. Here's a potentially dry story about our nation's first treasury secretary, 
made magnificent by rhymes and music by Lin-Manuel Miranda. Now, I'd, I had always drawn a line between rhyming and work. However, <clears throat> my neighbor's watching me from her window as I drive my tractor. I'm trying to drive straight, trying not to react to her. Then one day, face to face, I hear what she's saying. She's worried about what I'm spraying. I try to explain. I'm careful. Other growers say I'm judicious, but I'm not getting through. What can I say so you'll be less suspicious? I sound defensive. It stings. I hate being mistrusted. Where is presumed innocence? I feel like I'm being busted. So I change course and offer up scientific explanations, but I sound stiff. Hey, I'm trained in ad, not public relations. <sighs> Farming today is so stressful. It's not that children's bedtime story. The cows, the sheep, the pig, all that romance and glory. Every morning I get up and face several masters, the government, my customers, and weather disasters. The government's the reason for my food safety clerk. She administers the law, strangulation by paperwork. My customers say add more value. What they mean is lower your price. I'm only one farmer. I can't say no dice. And then the creatures show up with six legs and a munch. An army of insects wants my whole farm for its lunch. Pesky pests. Know what I do when I see them? Actually, I can fend off this invasion because I practice IPM. Let me spell that out for you. That's I for integrated, P for pest, M for management, integrated pest management. <clears throat> now, as names go, it's clunky, and some people hate it. It's not clear what it means, no matter how slowly I say it. The big question, though, is not what to name it. For people like my neighbor, it's how to explain it. There's no blueprint, no recipe, no one-size-fits-all. There's no automatic solution you can buy and install. What I do depends on context. So when those creatures come visit, I have to stop and assess just how threatening is it. IPM principle number one. Measure first, do nothing yet, until you've established an intolerable threat. So how do I stay chill when the bugs have my attention? I trade a pound of spray for an ounce of prevention. IPM principle number two, prevention. Think ecological. Your farm's alive. You've got to be knowledgeable about your crop's enemies and their enemies. So establish a balance. Leave chemistry on the shelf. Use your biological talents. Now. A warning for parents. This next part's rated X. It's about saving my farm by inhibiting sex. The villain, the coddling moth, could cause a catastrophic loss by doing the same we do, feeding our young applesauce. The moth lays her eggs near the fruit that she sees. Her entire agenda is reproducing her species. The worm's born, looks around, so far nothing remarkable. Then, a day or two later, that fruit is unmarketable. Well, that is intolerable. It's something I must act on. So I tackle this problem with my IPM hat on. Pheromones are what moths make to communicate. It's the perfume they put on when they search for a mate. But if I send out pheromones at an accelerated rate, I can keep them from mating. They won't even date. <laughs> this clever technology, mating disruption by name, it's like having my very own abstinence campaign. <laughs> when it's working, when there's balance, I can lighten up my patrol. But this is nature. It's always changing. I must be ready for more control. 
IPM principle number three, judicious control by chemical means. So I do have to spray when things are bad as it seems. I screen for safety, the impact on me and the environment, and I choose what to use based on legal requirement. IPM's come so far without notoriety. It's practiced the world over, yet still unknown by society. So when sustainability's on stage and the choir singing out loud, often not one IPM note can be heard by the crowd. Who conducts this sustainability chorus? When we use cover crops, you know it restores us. When we add organic matter, our soil's more porous. When we use biologicals, you're looking for more of us. When we use natural predators, you simply adore us. When we, can, when we protect bees, you approve, you say glorious. But if we use one synthetic, you instantly abhor us. We're no longer in your vision, you simply ignore us. Is the audience the nation or a small niche for this chorus? If you plan to reach everyone, you must make room for us. I should come down off my soapbox and get back to work. Harvest, pack, sell, and record it for my food safety clerk. My neighbor waves from her window, and I wave back. She knows me now. She gives me less flack. <sighs> Last year's offer, try a peach. Well, that did not compute, but this year I'm betting she'll eat a piece of my fruit. I, I promise, I do not fantasize about IPM on Broadway. <laughs> but I do fantasize about the masses waiting with bated breath for the local peach season to begin. However, the story of John Lyman and our eco-growers is pretty stuck. It's not getting through, even to people who are buying the peaches regularly. What is it about the human brain that makes this story so hard to tell. Excuse me, friend. You seem perplexed. Would you like some help sorting this all out? Yeah. Yes, I would. If only the world really worked this way. Part two. The story first. That offer of assistance that you heard a minute ago, that came from the field of cognitive science, which I have been studying. Surrounded by agricultural scientists, all of them with PhDs, I had to turn to cognitive scientists to really understand how communication works. In his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, Nobel Prize winning psychologist Daniel Kahneman teaches us that there are two modes of thinking fast thinking and slow thinking. Fast thinking is based on your emotions and your intuition. It operates automatically with little effort on your part. So you're using fast thinking to notice that somebody's angry or whatever their feelings are. You're using fast thinking when you answer two plus two equals. But if I say to you, what's 13 times 24? Now you employ your slow thinking system. Your slow thinking requires great mental effort. We call on it for analysis and for computation. The slow thinking system believes that it's in charge of your, of your world view and all of your choices. But what Kahneman teaches us actually is that the fast automatic system is in charge. He calls the fast system the hero of his book. He also calls it a machine for jumping to conclusions. An essential feature of the fast system, and this is the key, is that it only works with ideas that already are in your mind. The measure of success for the fast system is not thoroughness, it's the coherence of the story. The fast system is unfriendly to new facts and new information 
unless there's a story in your mind already. The stories are called frames. Frames are the mental structures we use to understand the world. We allow new facts and evidence in if we have an existing frame. And we have thousands of them that operate in all of us unconsciously. One of the dominant frames, one of the dominant narratives about food and farming in this country right now wants to keep John Lyman and our eco-growers on the sidelines. I call it the exclusive and purest narrative. The telling of this narrative comes wrapped in fear and mistrust. It's perfect for your fast thinking, emotional, automatic system. I get it. I subscribe to several newsletters from a few uh, consumer advocacy NGOs, and I get several every week, and they send me this week's list of the substances I should be afraid of and the people and the organizations I should mistrust. This narrative simplifies the complex world of farming to a binary, organic or conventional. It's why I call it exclusive. It doesn't see the whole broad realm of sustainable farmers who aren't organic as teammates. Steve Groff is a vegetable grower who grows for red tomato. He's located near the Susquehanna River, which empties into Chesapeake Bay. Graf raises heirloom tomatoes and winter squash for us. I've known him as long as I've known John Lyman. In 1982, he began measuring his organic matter content. Think of the organic matter content as the decomposed plant material that's in your soil. So when he measured it, he started at 2%. Today, his farm is at just under 6%. Now, that may not sound a lot, but if you're an agronomist or a farmer, that's an extraordinary accomplishment. And he's done it with mostly cover cropping. He uses a technology that knocks down his cover crops, kills them, and turns them into mulch that he can then plant into the next spring. So Graf calls himself a sustainable farmer. His fields are covered all year round, preventing soil erosion. An organic farmer doing a similar thing with cover crops would likely plow their crops under and rely on cultivation to, for weed control. Groff thought he could eliminate all of his herbicides in this system, and he found that he needs one in the spring to make his system work. But Groff says, you couldn't pay me to till or plow my soil anymore. I've built up so much life in the soil, and he's very proud of the 12 earthworms per square foot that he's got in his soil. The exclusive and purest narrative leaves out Steve Groff and it leaves out John Lyman because they make selective use of synthetic pesticides. The pesticides that are used by the organic sector are made, remember, from substances that can be found in nature. So an example would be pyrethrum made from the flowers of chrysanthemums. Uh, a parallel in the synthetic world would be pyrethroids, made from synthetics, but they're very, very similar, those two. It's a profoundly unsettling truth that we live surrounded by thousands of synthetic substances that we simply don't understand. Things like fingernail polish, shampoo, art supplies, plastic water bottles, cleaning products, and pesticides. Banishing them all at once, probably not going to happen. It might not even be effective. In the exclusive and purest narrative, there is no concept of responsible management of a synthetic pesticide. We're going to take an exercise now. Now it's time for you to look inside of your own fast and slow thinking systems. So I want to invite you to open the, en the, open the secret envelope in the middle of your tables and distribute the quiz one per person. OK. You're going to need a pen or at least a sharp fingernail. Tony, let's give everybody three minutes to take the quiz. After you take the quiz, you're then going to talk at your tables, 
and answer these questions. Take three minutes, don't think it too hard, and just do the best you can. Ready, go. Okay, everybody, time for table talk. Give it up. Time? Sounds like you're already into it. If you're a natural facilitator, help, help move the conversation around so nobody speaks for more than a minute or so, okay? And the questions are up there. They're also on your sheets. Go for it. Nine minutes, Tony. Hello, everybody. Talk. Talk is up. Silence, please. <laughs> come back, come back, come back. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. I really wish I could have heard all those conversations. Please consider this. Only 1% of the farmland currently in the United States is under organic management, certified organic management. If we are to scale this endeavor as we want, then all the growers actively building their soil health, employing IPM, protecting waterways and pollinators, practicing conservation, moving in the sustainable direction, all have to be included in the narrative and the practice of sustainable farming. As this room knows all too well, sustainability is not only a question of the farm alone, however, there is a marketplace we need to include. And when the marketplace and agriculture come together, things get way more complex. There are a couple things at Red Tomato, characteristics of this marketplace that are keeping us awake at night. One, <clears throat> the customers we sell to, mostly supermarkets, are brutally competitive and getting more so. They're impersonal, they're increasingly focused on low price. The second thing, people, more and more people, are struggling financially, they're having trouble affording the food that they want to buy, and it's getting harder and harder for us to pay farmers a fair price and to compete. I recently heard proponents of the exclusive and purist narrative at a conference I attended last fall, and when my impatient hand kept going up at the end of the presentation and I asked about the marketplace and the reality in which we're all working, the answer I got back adhered to a theory of change that says Americans pay the smallest percentage of their income on food. We need to pay more for food in order to support the real cost of growing food at a small scale and, at, and on organic farms. That theory of change doesn't match our circumstances. It doesn't match our economy. And unfortunately, it doesn't match the economy we're probably going to be moving into the next 10 years. You know, oftentimes, a new story, a new narrative, has to precede the change we want. The story comes first, and the change follows it. But one does, you just don't will such a story into being. There's got to be a plan. We need a plan. But who are we? We're a thousand small and mid-sized organizations. We're many thousands of small and mid-sized farms and urban gardens. This new food system has to scale. It's all over the conference. It's all over all of our agendas. What's our relationship to the whole that we're trying to build? How do we fit in? How do you fit in? These questions can be overwhelming. These are the moments when I turn back to that voice of my father and I hear, him saying, you can figure this out. <clears throat> this food system, we all say, 
is decidedly broken. We're good at the critique, we're rather outspoken. But reform and innovation are harder, let's face it. We have to fix this system or entirely replace it. Should I work from the edge or from the center? Where is hope? Let's look at the food system through a microscope. I remember it like yesterday. My clock radio said, Amazon buys Whole Foods. Whoa, well that got me out of bed. What's Jeff Bezos thinking? Not fast food, he's eating Whole Foods instead. But whatever he's thinking, this'll keep the investors well fed. Then, the internet exploded with analysis and comments. The food tech world gloated, finally proof of their dominance. The produce world showed its disdain for food tech's arrogance, while Wall Street was quoted, for how long can those stores afford rents? That's a really good question, yet they're still building a lot of them. Brand new stores, if you look, you can spot them. Have you seen Aldi or Lidl? They're from Europe, but we've got them. They're joining Walmart in the great race for the bottom. When a big fish eats a littler fish, synergy is the preferred word. But this is cost cutting with job loss. Any other version is absurd. The future is speed, convenience, and robotics. This is clear. Order online at your home in four hours. This future is already here. In this age of disruption, is price all that matters? What of product quality and service? Are they shredded in tatters? In this age of disruption, who are we and how do we fit in? How do we compete in a game of low bidding? You see that price they quoted me? You've got to be kidding. Look, the citizens are vocal. They want more food to be local. They want their corn from a yokel. They're demanding organic and no-till. They say bring fresh fish by the boat fill. Make everything fresher, greener, cleaner. That indeed's our proposal. When the soil's healthy, we're healthy. We're also more hopeful. We want food from here, not from Constantinople. The citizens have spoken. We need to reach everyone. So what's our game plan? Tell me, what is to be done? Who are we? We're agents, not cheerleaders. It's our job to connect the producers and eaters. Selling direct to the customer, now there's a mutual gain. If a question arises, the farmer's right there to explain. And the prices are higher, the farmer's paid on the spot, yet. A thousand direct-to-consumer transactions doesn't add up to a lot. There has got to be volume, logistics, and quality control if the benefits of good food are going to reach out to us all. But it's not direct sales or wholesale or farm to school or food tech or urban gardening. It's all the above, a total outpouring of food hubbering, kind of like an outpouring of love. We're small fish swimming upstream to our own rules. We need some advantage, some competitive tools, relationships, building trust into power. Now that's our regimen. Collaboration is one thing we can do better than them. Some collaborations are friendly, but none come for free. They all take persistence and listening and shared strategy. Some are fraught with tension more like collaborating with the enemy. But if it's working, hold back your judgment. They might prove trustworthy. Now and then, through such a partnership, an unexpected breakthrough, a wall comes down, a person changes. That person could be you. In small scale, at the edge, reform and innovation. While at the heart of the beast, infrastructure and systems are feeding a nation. The center needs the edge and the edge needs the center. If we can lower fear and mistrust, then imagination can enter. So if you are more of a David and not much a Goliath, when collaboration comes knocking, say, let's experiment, let's try it. We're scaling up operations to reach as high as we dare for our farms, for our communities, for ourselves. Let's build that bridge to there.
<clears throat> Collaborating is really hard and expensive and time consuming. So why? Why bother? Because it opens up vast opportunity that might not be opened otherwise. Collaboration is a way to learn from people who know things that you don't know. It's a way to work with people who can do things that your organization can't. It's a way to bring in resources you don't have. Presumably, you offer some of the same in exchange. You know, it's common to think about collaboration as something that starts when a group of people come together who see the situation the same way. So you spend a lot of time trying to get on the same page. And common ground surely helps. But a successful collaboration does not require that kind of alignment of worldview and values. Nor does it depend on some people in the room changing the minds of other people in the room. There's always conflict in the room, even among people like ourselves who come together over strong values. Sharing one pragmatic common purpose is sufficient grounds for collaboration. The most helpful and stimulating thing that I've read about collaboration lately is a book called Collaborating with the Enemy by Adam Kahane. Kahane started his career working for Royal Dutch Shell, corporate Europe, but he had to leave in order to pursue his passion. And he ended up consulting with the post-apartheid administration of Nelson Mandela. And he's also worked with revolutionary movements in both Latin America and Central America. While he was working in South Africa, at the end of a very intense session, one of the participants spoke up, trying to lighten things up a little. And that person said, facing such heavy situation, I only see two options for us. One is practical, the other is miraculous. The practical option would be for all of us to get down on our hands and knees and pray that angels will come and save us. <laughs> the miraculous option would be that we'd stay in the room and figure out how to work this through together. Well, Red Tomato, in our own way, in our own context, is currently working toward several collaboration miracles. One collaboration is to unify the research agenda of organic and IPM scientists. You know, at the farm level, organic and IPM are very compatible, and most farmers treat it that way. But in NGO and academic circles, we clever humans find ways to duel over definitions and the meanings of things. So definitions are helpful, but they also become walls. And this was proven at the early formation of the, or of the National Organic and IPM Working Group when Red Tomato joined forces with some others to try to get this off the ground. One of the recruits, a very prominent leader in the organic industry, said she wants in. She wants to participate, but if her colleagues found out that she was in this group, it could damage her career. So this group launched in confidence, and nobody's name was released. It's now three years later. The group is out of the closet, and it's growing. And they're doing good work. Another collaboration. This collaboration promises me that 10-second IPM story, that inclusive narrative. I was able to convince agricultural scientists to work hand in hand with cognitive social scientists, the soft sciences. These are linguists, anthropologists, and psychologists. In 2016, Red Tomato joined forces with the IPM Voice, a national advocacy group, and invited Frameworks Institute of Washington, D.C. to the table. Frameworks is a think tank of social scientists who specialize in science translation. So we are working on a five-year period to create that inclusive narrative. It will start by looking in the frames of current ordinary Americans, understanding how they think now in order to begin the reframing process. In 2009, 
I was thinking about how to make fair trade a more formal part of the Red Tomato program. I invited Eric Nicholson, a leader of the United Farm Workers Union, to our intimate growers meeting. Well, a union rep at a meeting of rural farmers, that could be a lightning rod. And then I handed out a report that was called Close to Slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center, which was an indictment of the H-2A program, which our growers use to recruit their harvest and orchard labor. The room was hot. You could just cut it with a knife. You could hear the mutterings about the report. This is insulting. This isn't right. What was he thinking? Well, it was John Lyman who got up and figured out how to bring the temperature in the room down 10 degrees. He said, look, this guy came from Seattle, speaking of Eric, he's in the room. We ought to at least let him talk so we can hear if there's an opportunity here for us. Eric, who has a lot of experience talking with growers, was able to win their confidence, and he even got invited to some of their farms afterwards. And what Nicholson explained was that the original paradigm around which the United Farm Workers organized, which was conflictive, organizing workers against the owners for better wages and working conditions. They were, loose, they were running out of steam with that paradigm. And they were rethinking, and he was reinventing their basic model. So the UFW and Oxfam America, the aid agency, and Costco, the retailer, came together, odd bedfellows indeed, to start an organization called the Equitable Food Initiative, which is now in its infancy. And the new paradigm is, let's improve the work process and the final end product so it has more value in the marketplace. Costco is definitely ready and willing to pay more for better products when they know that the farm is using fair labor practices. And so there now is a worker council going on where workers sit with management and try to figure out how to work together to make things better. This was all happening in the far western states. So Red Tomato went to EFI and said, what about a prototype with mid-size and small farmers in the northeastern United States? Now we're in the second year of a prototype with two of our farms, one of which is Lyman Orchards. The last collaboration I'm going to mention brings us back to peaches. In the early days when John Lyman came to me, he made those 3,000 cases available and we blew through them. Then John introduced us to two other Connecticut peach growers of scale and they became the ultimate collaboration vehicle for, our, for Red Tomato. We plan together with them, we price with them, they trade their products back and forth in this hair-raising, just-in-time manner to make product get to market in time. But we've reached a moment where we need more peaches. In order to keep the attention of the buyers, we have to have larger volume and a longer growing season. So we're meeting growers in the mid-Atlantic region. We are going south to achieve those aims. Now, John Lyman is in agreement with this gamble, even though it means we may end up buying less of his peaches at the start of the season. Scaling up with mid-sized farms takes this kind of collaboration, turning competitors into partners, growers working closely with each other, Red Tomato working closely with growers and trucking companies and produce companies to get stuff to market. It's what enables us to go up against the giants. It's tricky business. There's a lot of logistics involved, a lot of coordination. But if we can find that pragmatic common purpose, then we can start. And we can compete by offering sustainably grown product at prices that people can afford to pay and our buyers are willing to buy. At the end of the musical Hamilton, Vice President Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton face off in a duel meant to settle irreconcilable differences of politics and ego. Burr wins the duel, he kills Hamilton, and after a cooling off period, Burr reflects, now 
I'm the villain in your history books. I was too young and blind to see. I should have known. I should have known the world was wide enough for both Hamilton and me. Well, the world is obviously wide enough for John Lyman and me. The world is wide enough for a whole lot of difference. It's wide enough for evolution biologists and young Earth creation scientists. And our world of sustainable food and farming, where ideological duels abound, it's wide enough for both organic and IPM. It's wide enough for the pioneers who built organic and those who are building regenerative right now, and all those growers who are coming to sustainable practices for the first time. The lines that divide us, they're real. We learn them through stories that we hear in childhood. Some of them we create ourselves. They begin as thin lines. We add assumption upon assumption. And those thin lines calcify into thicker lines that get harder to cross. Time, history, ignorance can turn a thick line into this. Some lines, indeed, are dangerous to cross. The Underground Railroad, a concentration camp, they take huge risk, caution, and collective action. But many of the lines that divide us now they can be crossed with reasonable risk, persistence, practicing the skills of collaboration and listening. I think the success of the food movement depends on crossing these lines. For the sake of our farms, for the land, for our collective health, and for that glorious peach, that's what I'm collaborating for. <clears throat> In the beginning, one bite of an apple, and we begin in sin. OK. But could one bite of a peach become a thing? Of course it could, because when it's good, the juice on your chin is a magical ointment. But when it's bad, nothing short of profound disappointment. <laughs> it's true. One third peach eaters unsatisfied, a recent poll went. Per capita consumption is down 50%. Aha, it must be high prices, is that it? No, not really. The poll says they're too hard, not enough flavor, or they're mealy. Oh my, this is scandalous. How high up does it reach? Is there a minister of stone fruit we will have to impeach? <laughs> Settle down, friends. Public outrage is misguided behavior. We can solve this right here if we just follow the flavor. On the road to flavor, the sugar contents the ticket. Not one molecule more sugar can be made once you pick it. So keep the peach on the tree in the sun in the dark, yet the peach must be firm enough to make it safely to market. On that road to flavor, alas, a fork in the highway. The wisdom of industry says, I prefer doing this my way. Hardness, a must. Sweetness, eh, there'll be some we trust. But let's look at size and color, or peach sales go bust. With that wisdom, a peach picked too soon or in storage too long will be absent aroma and flavor and the mouthfeel, it's all wrong. That's precisely what leads to consumer despair. Uh, instead of that peach, I, I think I'll try that pear over there. <clears throat> Do you see it? An opportunity not to be taken for granted in which the locally grown peach has competitive advantage. It can be harvested firm, but not hard as a rock. It's a short ride to market, not a week on a truck. Now, I'm not saying the local peach deal's a slam dunk. The farmer's got to do lots right, or the whole deal will be sunk. But if the branches are pruned to the desirable height and the blossoms are pollinated by bees in flight, 
and the young fruit is thinned, not too heavy, not too light, and nitrogen's applied, not too much, not too slight. And if there is sun, it's sufficiently bright and plenty of heat by day and by night, and there's rain, the fruit sizes, yes, quite. Just a modicum of insects, no disease, no blight, and the harvest timing is tight. Then it's off to market to be displayed in plain sight, taken home and left out till it's perfectly ripe. This peach is now qualified for one glorious bite. Then another and another, this is pure delight. The juice is running down my chin. I just might keep on eating it anyway in spite of this horrible mess. And I won't hesitate to invite my next door neighbors over for peach cobbler tonight. This peach is righteous. These are local peaches done right. Thank you.